Hey there, I'm Source Make, and welcome to the video on the algorithm technique backtracking. And we're going to use backtracking to solve the famous Boggle problem, which happens to be this lead code medium problem. So in this video, we are going to talk about what backtracking is and how it works. We are going to look at an analogy I set up with a real world example for how backtracking would actually work in the real world. And it has nothing to do with code, so it should be super simple to understand. We are then going to look at the problem statement for the lead code medium problem called word search, which happens to be the boggle problem just to understand the rules. Then we are going to look at the solution for that using backtracking. So we're going to go over the algorithm for that solution using backtracking and then we are going to look at the pseudocode that I wrote out. And it's actually really simple once you understand the technique. So that should be really easy and we're going to go over that pretty much in depth. And then I've got some full C++ code written out here that we are going to go over at a very high level. So if C++ isn't your language, don't worry about it because it's basically one-to-one -one with the pseudocode. The pseudocode is pretty true to what the algorithm is going to require for any programming language. So we're going to compile that C++ code and lead code, run it, make sure that it works. And that's basically going to be it for this video. So if you need to get to this code or get to the lead code page, you can click the links below this video to get to this page. And while you're down there, hit the subscribe button for this YouTube channel. Thanks. So backtracking, this is pretty fun and it's a good technique to understand to add to your tool belt. So backtracking is a technique that you would use when you use recursion or when you use DFS and the trick is this. You want to pass the variable around by reference, not by copy. Remember, recursion means you have a function and the function keeps calling itself. And so it would be really expensive to make a copy of a variable every single time you make the recursive calls. So that's why you pass it by reference so that you don't make that copy every single time. What you want to do specifically for backtracking is you want to edit that variable. You want to make the recursive calls to, you know, further recursive calls. And then you want to undo that edit when you get back and finish with these recursive calls. And so the reason that this works is because DFS is deterministic. It goes in a depth first order. That's why it's called a depth first search. What that means is we have a certain level and we do our work on it. And that's when we're going to make that edit to our variable. Then we are going to make further recursive calls to that same function. And they are going to inherit that variable in the state that we give it to them in. So whenever they do their work, they're going to have it in the state that they needed to based on what we gave it to them as. And then when they finish their work, when they pass back function control back up to our recursive call, the one that we made the call from, then we will be able to undo that edit so that whoever called us will get the state back in the same way that they gave it to us in. And so that's kind of how it works. It's about giving the state back in the way that um, it was given in. And so let's look at a real world example and analogy to see how this works. Let's put pretend that we have a kitchen that is going to be our shared variable. Only one person is going to use this kitchen at a time. And so let's say our mom is the original owner of this kitchen and our mom gives us the kitchen. She lets us use the kitchen and it's given to us in a certain state. So let's say we want to use the kitchen to eat some cheese and crackers. We take some cheese and we take some crackers and we eat it. So now the kitchen is missing cheese and crackers. But then let's say that we let our friend use the kitchen and our friend uses the kitchen by using some dishes to make some food or something like that. And then he washes those dishes. And so our friend stops using the kitchen and he returns ownership back to us. So now the kitchen is back to us. And even though our friend had used those dishes, he washed them and put them away. And so the kitchen is back to the state that we had it in, back where it's just missing the cheese and crackers. Now, now that we have ownership of the kitchen again, and it's still in the state that we had it in, let's say that we want to let our dad use the kitchen. And so our dad gets the kitchen, he eats some cookies, that means he removes some cookies from the kitchen. And right now the state of the kitchen is it's missing the cheese, it's missing the crackers, and it's missing the cookies. And let's say our dad passes ownership of the kitchen to our uncle. So let's say our uncle uses the kitchen, he turns the oven on, he turns the oven off, so he undoes the change that he made. And since he's done using the kitchen, he returns ownership back to our dad. Our dad gets the kitchen back in the state that he had left it in, which is it's missing the cookies and it never had the cheese and crackers because we didn't give it to him with cheese and crackers. 
And so what our dad does before giving ownership back to us is he buys some cookies to replace what he ate. Now the cookie, now, now the kitchen is back to having those cookies and he stops using the kitchen. He returns ownership to us. Now we have ownership of the kitchen. It's just missing the cheese and crackers that we ate. So what we do before we give ownership back to our mom is we buy some cheese and we buy some crackers to replace what we ate. The kitchen is now back in the state that our mom gave it to us in, even though a bunch of people used it and our mom gets the kitchen back in the exact condition that she returned it to us in. So the moral of this story is that even though there were a ton of people who were using the kitchen, they always undid the change that they made when they were giving ownership back. And so they they were getting the kitchen in a certain state, right? Our dad never had cheese and crackers in the kitchen because we ate them and our uncle never had any cookies in the kitchen because our dad ate them and and so that was fine for when they were using the kitchen but anytime it got back up to the previous caller they got the kitchen back in that exact state because the person who did the change undid the change and that's basically what backtracking is remember you you're using this shared variable because you're passing it around by reference you're editing it to the way you need it to be done and then whenever you give, you, you let anyone else use the kitchen by making those recursive calls. And then you undo the edit back when you get ownership again. And so that's basically how backtracking works. And the reason that this works is it's a DFS thing and we have this shared variable. That's how it ties into code. And the reason that it's a pretty good technique is because it saves time and memory. It saves time and memory because we can all use the same kitchen. You know, we don't have to have a thousand copies of the kitchen for each individual person. We can just use that shared resource. So that's basically what backtracking is at a super high level to be easy to understand. Let's look at applying that to the Boggle problem, which is this lead code medium word search problem. So this is the Boggle problem. We are given a 2D board of tiles, which contain letters and a word, and we want to check if the word exists inside of the board. Now here's the rules. You can start from any tile when you need to, you know, check if the word exists, and you're allowed to travel to adjacent tiles, which are up, down, left, and right, but you cannot reuse any of those tiles. And so if you look at this diagram right here, we can see, let's say this is the given board, and we want to search for the word source, SRC. Well, if you start right here and you go right and you go up, you can see SRC does exist within this board. All of these tiles match. And so this board does contain the word source. We would return true from our function. So let's say we are given the same board and we want to search if the board contains the word dad. Well, we could try to use this D and then go over to this A and then go back to this D. And that would complete the word dad, but we're reusing this tile. And so that breaks this rule right here. And so that's not valid. And so we would say that the board does not contain the word dad. And so finally, let's search this board one more time for the word cry. And we could see that if we did something like this, C-R-Y, we could find the word cry, but this is not adjacent. You know, we're going from this tile over here and this is somewhere diagonal. We're not allowed to do that. We can only go up, down, left, or right. And so we would say that the board does not contain the word cry. And so our function would return false. And so that's basically the Boggle problem. You've got this board of tiles that are basically letters and we're, we're just searching for words by traversing the board. And so, how, do, how would we actually solve this? Well, we're going to start out right away using backtracking. We're not going to look at the naive approaches because they're really kind of complicated. And it's actually hard to code up. It's actually harder to code up the naive approaches. I remember coding this up and it was really ugly. So the backtracking solution is this. We're going to try each tile as the beginning of our traversal. And what we want to recursively do is we want to check if that tile is valid, which basically means it's inbound in the board. You know, we don't want to go outside of the bounds of the board. And we want to make sure that the character is going to match the tile of the board matches the character in the word that we're checking. So for example, we're going to start out looking for the word source. And if we were checking this tile, we would try to compare it with the word S. And we would see that D does not match S, so we would return false right there. But if we were trying to check this tile as the beginning of the word or for any recursive call, we would see that S does match S. And so we would say this check passes. So the tile is valid. And then we want to invalidate that tile by changing it to some invalid character like an asterisk. 
And we know that the asterisk is not going to be part of any valid word input, so we can do that. And the reason is because, like in this example, we don't want to reuse the character, the tile D, because once it's used, we're not going to use it again. So we want to invalidate it by making it some invalid tile or invalid character. So then we want to make our recursive calls to check left, right, up, and down tiles. So now that we match like this word D, we want to see if we can match the character A. And so that's why we would check left, right, up, and down. We would check those tiles, and this tile would be invalid. We, that's because we changed the state of the board to make this invalid on step two. Once we finish those recursive checks, we would undo the tile invalidation by changing it back to the original tile. So when we made these recursive calls, we would make this an asterisk, we would change this. But once we get back to finishing these recursive calls, we would change this back to a D. And then finally, what we do, our boundary condition is, we're gonna return true if the tile was the end of a word. For example, if we matched the tile C, then we know that we found the word, and so we return true because we know that we found it. The board does contain the word source. Otherwise, we will return if any of our recursive calls had returned true or not. So, so that's how it would work. Return true if the tile was the end of the word or if any of the recursive calls did return true. So once again, the backtracking part of this solution is that we are changing the shared state, which is going to be the board, in step two. We make our recursive calls to check other tiles, and then we undo our change for when we finish our function. And that's what backtracking is. So let's look at the pseudocode. We've got a function named board contains. It returns true or false, a Boolean. We pass in the board, which is going to be a 2D array, and we pass in the word, which is going to be a string that we want to see, does the board contain this word? So but this is an edge case right here. If the word is empty or null, then we just return false automatically. Otherwise, we try each tile as the start of a word. So we're just going to have an i and j that goes through the number of rows and the number of columns. This i and j represents the position of the tile in our board. And so what we're going to do is we are going to make this call to our recursive function, which is named DFS. We're going to pass in the board. We're going to pass in that tile i and j, its position. We're going to pass in zero, which indicates the index of the word for the character that we're trying to match. So if we're passing in the word source, then we're trying to start out by matching that first character, which is going to be S. And this is, this is going to return true or false. If we found the word, then our overall function is going to return true. True, we did find the word source in the board. Otherwise, we return false down here if none of the tiles were the start of the word. So then we've got this recursive function right here named DFS. It returns true or false, a Boolean. As we saw, we pass in the 2D array that represents the board. We're passing it in by reference, remember, because we are going to edit this board for our recursive calls. We don't want to make copies. We're passing in the i and j, which represents the position of the tile. We're passing in the word index of the character in the word that we're trying to match. We're going to start out by trying to match the first character, and then we're going to try to continuously match each character in the word. And we're going to pass in the word itself that we're trying to match, or, or that we're trying to see if the word contains. So now the actual meat of this function if i or j is out of bounds, then we return false. Remember, we have to be inside of the board. If the character does not match, which means the character at this tile, board of this tile position, doesn't match the word of this word index, that means, you know, we have like a, we're trying to match a T and we got an M or something like that. So since the tiles don't match, we return false. And then if the tile does match, then we can continue on. And coincidentally, if this was the last word index, which means it was the last character in the word, then we found the word. So we return true. That is our edge case for when we find the word. So we matched the, by this line of code, we matched the tile. And so if it was the last one, we return true. Otherwise, we have to continue checking tiles because that wasn't the last one. And so what we would do is we invalidate this tile as part of our backtracking. We keep track of what the old letter was at this tile position. We update this tile position to be the asterisk. Then we make our recursive calls by doing a DFS. We, this is the recursive call we call DFS of the board. Remember, we updated board at this level, so our further levels are going to inherit this updated board. 
And then we are going to try left by updating i and j for each one of these ones. We are going to try to match the next tile character by updating the word index. And then we're going to pass in the exact same word. And so this is just this sort of neat trick where we're using this or statement where if any one of these returns true, then we found the word. And so it's true that we did find the word. That's basically what this or means. And so we do our recursive calls. And then we want to fix this tile by updating it back to what the old letter was. And then we return true or false if we found the word in any one of these recursive calls. And so that's basically what the pseudocode is. It's actually really short and easy to understand. I think it's pretty easy. It's basic DFS. And it's backtracking, as we saw. Invalidate the tile, do the recursive call, fix the tile, and return if any of our recursive calls did find this, this boundary condition where it matched the last character. So that was the pseudocode. Let's look at the full C++ code really quickly. And the full C++ code is right here. Boolean function to check if the board contains the word of the character named exists. In C++, we are having our 2D array represented as a vector or vector of characters. And we've got this constant string that represents the word. It's constant because we're not updating it. Interviewers like to see const correctness, by the way, and descriptive variable names. So make sure you try to do that. That's a, a pro tip. So if the word is empty, return false. Otherwise, try each character in the board as the start of the you know match that we're going to find. Recursively call DFS. If DFS returns true, then return true. Otherwise, we return false that we didn't find the word. And then we've got this recursive DFS function passing in the board by reference passing in the tile position, same thing as before. If we're outside of the boundary conditions, then return false. If this tile doesn't match the word at this index, then return false. The, if we did match, then if this was the last character in the word, return true. Otherwise, invalidate this tile, make our recursive calls, and then undo the change that we made for the invalidation, and then return if any of our recursive calls found the actual last character, which means that we did find the word. So I've copied that. I'm pasting it into lead code. You can't really see. I'm hitting run code to make sure that it compiles. And we went over the C++ really simple because it's actually like the same as the pseudocode. So it did compile. I'm going to click the submit button. You can kind of see I did this already. And 65% and 67%. I tried to make this code really easy to understand, so I didn't do like any hyper optimizations. And we care about the backtracking, so that was it. That's actually what backtracking is. Once again, to restate one last time, backtracking is passing a variable around by reference, and you want to edit that variable, make your recursive calls, and undo the edit. That's that's kind of how you have to think about it. And the reason that it works is because now we have this shared state for this variable, and we don't have to create a new one every single time. And that's basically what backtracking is. I'm going to be doing some further videos on some more advanced backtracking problems, like the famous N queen problem. So that's also backtracking. I chose this boggle problem because it's really easy to understand. And I tried to go over this with a really simple explanation. So that was backtracking. Hopefully you know it now. It's really good to have in your tool chain. And thanks for watching. If you like this video, please like it. Please leave a comment if you want to see something else or if you have a comment to make. Please subscribe to this video, to this YouTube channel, and follow me on social media. I'm Source Make. Thanks for watching.